let's talk about fatigue. So last week we talked physical elasticity, so how materials respond um, basically dynamically. So to prior to prior to that we had kind of assumed an elastic behavior. The second I applied a load a stress, there was a corresponding strain. At the second I applied a strain, there was a corresponding stress, and they just kind of went hand in hand. Um, last week we kind of looked through that the fact that that may not always be the case, and that there may be some time dependent response of materials depending on the material. Some more pronounced than others. Generally, polymers are are the materials you think of as viscoelastic. Technically, every material has some viscoelastic behavior. Um, it's just whether or not it's as pronounced on the time scale that you're interested in. Um, so fatigue is also a time dependent material property, but now we're going to be looking at specifically how material properties degrade over time through cyclic loading. So it's the degradation of properties with cyclic loading. Um, so generally this is due to damage, so due to damage, and it's particularly related to uh, crack growth in a material. So it's related to fracture. Um, crack. So when we looked at fracture about a week, two weeks ago, um, we were specifically saying if I have a crack in a material and I pull it beyond a certain load, then that crack will rapidly propagate and I'll get brittle failure or I'll get catastrophic failure of the material based on fracture. Um, the question now for fatigue is what happens when I don't load it all the way up to that fracture strength? What happens if I load it below the yield strength of the fracture strength of the material, and I just keep doing that over and over and over and over and over again? And so what happens when, what happens when my maximum stress is less than my ultimate stress or fracture stress? So you've probably all seen some variant of this in real life, specifically with paper clips, um, which I'm sure if you've ever, I don't know if anybody actually uses paper clips anymore, which you've hopefully at least seen one and played with one at some point. So initially the paper clip is fairly strong and stiff because um, it's made of steel, but then if I cycle it, I mean pretty quickly actually, uh, it's probably an old paper clip, uh, it gets brittle and tears into pieces. Um, and so that was particularly fast because I was going plastically deforming this thing. But even if I didn't plastically deform it, if I just kind of applied a very low sinusoidal load here, eventually the part on this thing where there was a high stress would start to, the material properties would start to degrade. And eventually I'd get fracture somewhere. Let's see. Oh, that's sharp now. Nope, this isn't, that's good. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, okay, so the idea now here is if we look at our stress strain curve, the one that we had seen before at the very beginning of the class, there's some yield strength, some ultimate strength, ultimate stress strain. Um, there's an elastic region here. If I load it up too high beyond a certain point, I get here to the to the fracture stress or to the ultimate stress, and then I get breakage to happen. If I load here, kind of up below the yield, below the ultimate stress, up to the up to some yield stress, I, I'd say it, it comes up, and then it would load back down elastically, and then I would load back up, and I could bring it back along that loading path, and it would just kind of keep going. And eventually, if I kept following that, I would get failure. But before that, in this elastic regime, I kind of just assumed that if I, if I stay here in this elastic regime and I cycle it back and forth and back and forth, 
it's, it'll just stay there, that nothing actually happens when I deform this thing elastically. Um, that, as you probably seen to some effect, is an engineering approximation. There's no, there's no actual linear, perfectly elastic linear, perfectly linear elastic regime here. Anytime I'm deform, anytime I'm stressing a material, there's some generally some sort of deformation internally that's taking place, for other than for a very limited number of materials. Um, for something like a like a like a metal, when I'm loading here, even in this elastic regime, I'm getting some dislocation motion. I'm getting some crack opening. I'm getting some some microstructural something that's happening in the material. So, basically, if I if I have a crack in a material, some length, initially a, um, and I load it up under stress. This is for something plastic. It'll it'll deform, and then when I unload it, it'll come back almost to where it was before, um, maybe to some A plus a delta A. So it hasn't actually propagated fully, but even just by pulling on it a little bit, I'm getting some amount of plastic deformation at the, at the root of that tip, at the root of that crack. Um, so I'm getting gradual, gradual crack plasticity. So I'll say like gradual plasticity at cracks, or if I have <coughs> if I have grains in my material, if I have some grain boundary that's leading to a high stress, when I uh, when I deform this thing, then here in the grain I have a high high stress. in the grain. That'll cause this grain to slip just a little bit. It'll cause dislocations, some dislocations to move in the grain, some to start to pile up, um, some reorientation of the grain, all because of that high stress concentration. So if you remember at the very, maybe not the very beginning, maybe like the second week of class, I showed that video of the, the nano pillar being deformed and you saw the high stresses at the, at the, comp at the grain boundary there. Uh, and you've got a lot of dislocations moving, that's what's happening internally um, at the grains. So you, you can get gradual plasticity at cracks, you can get gradual slipping or dislocations at grains. And so this, this gradual accumulation of damage kind of starts to build up over time in the material and eventually knocks down the material properties. So you can imagine if I, if I, every time I cycled this A, every time I cycled some crack in a material, it grew by just an infinitesimal amount. Then after thousands or millions of cycles, eventually that would get up to kind of a critical crack size in a material and it would cause failure to happen. Um, so this is generally a very empirically motivated field. So last week we, we had the, the kind of a mechanical analogy model where we, where we had springs and dash pots and we came up with some nice ODEs that represented some of the viscoelastic behavior. Fatigue is generally kind of the opposite where the relationships that come out in fatigue are almost all empirically motivated. So people just do a whole bunch of tests and it's a whole lot of curve fitting to those test results. Um, so it's a big field. There's a whole lot of work that's been done and it's arguably one of the most important things to keep in mind in engineering just because if your part can survive, you, you, you always want your part to survive at least one loading cycle. If you want it, if you're, if you're I don't know, driving a car, you want your motor to be able to turn a little bit. But over time, the turning of those axles, the, the fluttering of an airplane wing or a, or a wind turbine blade, that cyclic repeated stress will inevitably knock down material properties. And understanding how those material properties are knocked down is, is hugely important to consider. Um, unfortunately, there's not uh, a whole lot of nice clean analytic relationships we can derive. So we're going to kind of go through today 
some of the terminology behind fatigue and then some of the ways that people think about these fatigue problems and how they classify them um, from an engineering standpoint. So there won't be as nice ODEs, but um, this, is, this is how people approach these sorts of problems. Um, okay, so questions so far? Cool. Cool, cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to define now uh, a load cycle. So what am I talking about when I when I talk about cyclic loading? Let's say a load cycle. Load cycle terminology. So now I'm going to define over time some stress. This is going to be a cyclic loading. So here I'm going to have some maximum stress and some minimum stress, stress over time t. Um, here max is just going to be my maximum applied stress sigma min is the minimum applied stress. Um, these aren't necessarily the quantities that are actually important. What's actually important, what we're most considering is the amplitude. Sigma A is uh, the stress amplitude. So <clears throat> stress amplitude, which is the max minus the min over 2. So here, if I had kind of a sine graph, this would be my amplitude if this was centered at zero. Um, and then my uh, mean stress. So sigma m is my mean stress, which is the max plus the min over two. So uh, the mean stress here, if I have a graph centered around zero, this uh, sigma m would be zero for that type of a graph. Um, but if I had kind of a high applied working load, if I had some stress that was going over like this, over time t, stress max min, uh, oops, sorry, sigma m, sigma a. Um, here, my mean stress is the stress, uh, the the average stress there, and the amplitude is is half the distance between the max and the min. So, this these two quantities, the sigma a and the sigma m, are the most important quantities for how fatigue is classified. So. Generally, when we're talking about fatigue, we talk about stress amplitude and mean stress. We don't actually look at what the max and the min are, just because we're assuming that there's some cyclic loading. It turns out it doesn't actually matter for most. So some materials are classified differently under fatigue than others. Um, most of this stuff that we'll be talking about today is particularly applicable to metals, uh, which is where people look at fatigue. If you look at ceramics or glasses, they'll still fatigue, but it's generally not cyclic loading fatigue, it's time-based fatigue. So if you, if you just hold a stress constant on glass or a ceramic, the crack will slowly grow out over time and it'll propagate. Um, and so that's how ceramics and glasses are classified. For metals, it's more important to know how many times that stress is cycled around. Um, than what the, the actual duration of time of the stress is. Um, so that, that cyclic back and forth is, is more important for metals. Uh, and that'll be, again, most of the terminology for what we're talking about today. Uh, there's one other quantity, uh, the stress ratio, which 
gets used sometimes and is good to know our stress ratio which is the max over the min or sorry min over the max so this would be um, minus one for uh, if the magnet so for here if the magnitude of the max was equal to the magnitude of the min or the mean stress was equal to zero um, yes so here my my min stress would be minus my max stress so my r would be minus one this would be zero if my minimum stress was zero and it would be infinity if my max was zero um, R doesn't come up as much, but it's still kind of a useful quantity to know just in terms of characterizing things. Um, okay, so, oh, I'm going to stay on this page. So, <coughs> when we talk about fatigue, there's one curve in particular that kind of comes up most frequently, uh, and that's something known as an SN, SN curve. So, S and so we say S um, instead of stress. S here is the nominal, nominal applied stress. And what I mean by that, so if I have just say a uniform rod that I was applying some load to, some P. Um, my S is just P over A, which is the same way that we normally define our stress. If I had something like a beam instead, and I was applying some moment to it, um, my S for my beam would be MC over I, where this is 2C, um, so it's basically the maximum stress here at the top. Um, so it would be the max at kind of the top or the bottom. Um, if I had something like a plate with a hole in it instead, let's draw this. Paste some stuff. This plate had some thickness T, some width W, and a hole D. Put that went through to the other side. And I was now applying some load P to this. Uh, my nominal stress would basically be the stress at this cross section. So stress is P over T times the the area that cross section is W minus D minus D, um, which is different than the so you remember from two weeks ago uh, the stress the maximum stress here that the root was three sigma or which would be um, just the the far field applied stress P over W T and then three times that would be the stress here. So the, the nominal stress is slightly different than that. It's just kind of the, the max average stress over that, or the average stress over that cross section. Um, so it's, it's defined a little bit differently depending on exactly the loading case, but this is why we use the, the symbol S instead of sigma. So for most cases, most fatigue problems will just be looking at a uniaxial rod getting stressed back and forth, um, or sometimes a beam getting flexed. Uh, so, so a lot of the time they'll use sigma in SN curves instead of S, but the S is technically there for nominal stress for general loading cases. Okay, so for SN curves, if now this 
start plotting this out. So I'm going to look at S. Um, now I'm going to start taking one, uh, let's say, 10, 20, 30, 40 times 10 to the sixth, um, N and S. So now what I'm what I'm going to plot here is my N F is my number of cycles to failure. And I want to find out if I apply a certain stress, how many cycles to failure I have to, to apply. So if I apply basically my, my ultimate stress up here, this would be my ultimate stress. So that's if I if I went straight to um, straight to that applied stress on my stress strain curve, it only takes one cycle to fail. Um, I just go straight and it fails. If I am lower, if I apply less stress than my ultimate stress, what you end up with is kind of a big clustering of points going down, and then over time, this will kind of start to drop off like that. So you'll get a curve that's something like this where it's gradually decreasing over time um, but has this kind of sharp upswing at the beginning. So this is generally not a super useful way to look at stress but this is what it would look like if you plotted it on, nor on a normal scale. So what we do instead generally um, is we look at these on, on either a, a semi-log plot or a log-log plot. So we look either here, um, and F, but plot it on a log plot. So this would now be um, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Um, and this would still be plotted normally. So um, say this is 3, 4, 5. So this is something like 800, 700, 600, 500. Um, so this would be reasonable for something like a steel. Um, what you would actually get <coughs> is if you started plotting this out, there'd be kind of two general deformation regimes, um, where you get something like this, something that kind of sharply dropped down, and then eventually oh, started to plateau out. So I want to do this. I'm still going to draw this. Enter right here. This. Cut tails off. There we go. Okay. Um, so when we do these tests, uh, we or when when people do these tests, they generally apply. Oh, I this one. Um, they apply a constant stress amplitude here, so uh, they give. You can. It's easy to define what the max and the min stress are, uh, and what the mean stress are, what the mean stress is. Uh, so they're they're generally at a constant applied stress. Sorry, this should be six S A. So this is generally applied plotted in terms of stress amplitude, um, but you'll plot you'll apply a certain stress amplitude, where you'll get. Um, points lying along a line. So this now, basically these these points would all lie along the same stress amplitude line. So this is often how, what these graphs look like. And then over time it kind of drops down. So what you have now, there's, there's three regimes in general here. Um, this first regime is low cycle to failure or low fatigue cycle or low cycle fatigue, that's it. Low cycle 
fatigue. This region, high cycle, fatigue, and then this is your stable stress or stable, uh, kind of stable long term stress, far long term stress. Um, so here, this low cycle fatigue region, I didn't exactly plot it on the right range, but um, here, low cycle fatigue. Fatigue is generally on the order of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3, or sorry, my NF. Um, NF, uh, I'm just going to erase this whole thing. There we go. NF is on the order of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3. And basically, this is also. Uh, generally above the yield stress of the material. So generally uh, the stress amplitude is greater than um, the, the yield stress for my for my material. Um, and so what generally so what this looks like in my stress strain diagram so you remember I kind of have these deformation regimes, sigma yield, sigma ultimate, strain, stress. Um, basically what I'm doing in here is I'm kind of applying some stress out here, slightly above, but below my ultimate stress. And I'll end up just kind of gradually working my way out on this curve. Because over time, as each cycle kind of goes, those infinitesimal cracks and voids and grains will start sliding and I'll, I'll get this kind of gradual working out um, as, I, as I apply more and more cycles. As I apply more and more cycles. And so this is kind of what happens in low cycle fatigue. So I'm in, in a plastic deformation regime, so I know I'm permanent, permanently plastically deforming my material to begin with, um, just a little bit. And then um, kind of what we, what we would have thought before uh, is I would kind of come up to this failure point and I would keep going back and forth to that same point on my stress strain plot. Realistically, that's not what happens. And gradually that damage accumulates and I, I get some sort of failure here at a slightly lower stress than what my ultimate stress would be, um, depending on the number of cycles <coughs> to failure. High cycle fatigue. High cycle fatigue. Um, so this one now, I'm staying below. So my end of failure uh, is kind of less than normally 10 to the 6th, uh, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th, ran out of room. Um, and in this high cycle failure regime, what I'm doing is I'm well below uh, my, oh, here's my SA, uh, staying well below my ultimate stress, or my yield stress. Um, side note, uh, or not side note, clarification. Uh, this is specifically for my mean stresses equal to zero. Um, and I'll, I'll talk in a little bit about how that changes when mean stress isn't zero. Um, but here now, I'm basically cycling in this low strain regime over and over. And so even if I'm, I'm kind of well below, maybe not well, well below, uh, my ultimate stress I can still eventually get failure to happen. Maybe something more realistic is kind of out here. Let's say I say there. Bring this up a little bit. There we go. So even if I'm still a good amount lower than my ultimate stress, yeah. It's, sorry. 
strain, stress. Um, so even if I'm still way lower than what my ultimate stress is, eventually this will actually kind of fail at a low, at a much lower stress than what I would expect just from a uniaxial tension test. Um, and so this is generally what we're talking about with high cycle fatigue. Um, at long time scales, at large numbers of stresses, um, there's not for all materials, but for some materials, um, there is something known as a as an equivalent. No, not equivalent. E is what is E? E. How am I blanking on the name for E? No, no, no. Um, so here now, at some, for some materials at some long time scale, there's value S E or sigma E. And that E stands for something. Ah, oh, daily second time is really getting to me. Um, but this is kind of the, the far field, or the, the stable stress. Sigma E is my stable stress where it'll actually start to plateau. So not all materials do this. This is specifically for uh, generally steels, for steels and some uh, other FCC metals. Um, but basically there's, so over time, you'll have some initially high stress. Uh, that'll start to degrade if I go both the plastic regime. It'll start to degrade um, at a different rate if I go uh, below the plastic regime. And then if I go kind of long stress cycles, generally, and uh, and it, n is greater than ten to the six, so um, more than a million cycles. Uh, then it kind of just reaches this stable stress, um, and the material properties don't actually degrade. So if I stay below that SE, I'm actually kind of at a st at a safe long term working limit. Um, but most materials are not designed in that regime. Um, most materials are kind of designed with some intended life cycle fatigue. So you know what the stress stress life is on a certain part, and you'll design it to have some cyclic working load higher than that um, stable stress. This isn't always the case. Other materials, particularly aluminum, have kind of a, a degradation over time. Um, how do I where's all the stuff? All of my notes are terribly disorganized. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, here we go. So, now, uh, for this sort of a plot, there we go. Um, so for this type of plotting, when I plot on a, for this, uh, for this log, or semi-log, log, log, not log plot, semi-log relation for um, high cycle fatigue. I can say my SA or my sigma A, my stress amplitude is related to my cycles to failure now. Um, based on some linear relationship, C plus D log uh, of NF. So here now, this slope is basically some D over time. And I can say that um, there's some exponential decay with time over time, um, and that there's just some, some linear relationship there on the log semi-log plot. Um, and this is sort of one common way of looking at materials. 
um, or looking at SN failure of materials. The other way, which is um, sometimes more common, is looking at this on a is looking at stress amplitude and cycles to failure on a log log plot. So now. S, A, and N, F. Um, I'm going to start now at 10 to the 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, here now, uh, let's say this is 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2, and there's some log scaling now between these guys. Um, so SA on a log scale and NF for 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th, also on log scale. Um, and what we can, what we'll end up with here Oh, this is degrading way too fast. Um, something that looks sort of like that. Um, so now, at long time scales, this kind of starts to plateau off, um, and we'll end up with some data around in these different regimes. Uh, this is maybe slightly exaggerated over what it would be. Um, but now on this log-log scale, I can say that there's some different scaling relationship. Now we're also in a high cycle fatigue regime. Um, these are all at a given applied stress or stress amplitude. Um, and in this regime, I can say my uh, stress amplitude, my sigma A, or my SA, SA, or sigma A, um, is equal to A and F to the B, or um, or sigma F prime times two and F to the B. So that basically now is in here in this regime uh, there's some B or B um, scaling that is roughly linear in moderate like 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 six scaling regimes uh, or cycle sorry 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 cycles to failure and eventually for steels, this would still plateau off to some stress, or um, for something like aluminum, there actually is no um, there's no stress equilibrium, and so there's no point where it kind of reaches a plateau, which kind of continuously degrades over time. Um, so depending on your material, you can have that long field or long time working stress lower bounds, um, or it could just kind of keep degrading. So uh, for this relationship, this is again, I'm going to say for sigma m is equal to zero, although I could be plotting this for whatever because I'm not really adding in hard numbers here. Um, to give some numbers for this, so this is, this is generally a more common representation of it. Um, you'll see it in both forms, either on a semi-log plot or on a log-log plot. Um, but most of the time data is reported in terms of this log log scaling. It's not as common to see the uh, to see this sort of a scaling relationship. It's more common to see this one. Um, and to give you an idea now of what this is for certain materials, let's do material. Uh, 
Uh, yield stress, ultimate stress, F prime, and uh, B or B. So for something like a 4340 steel, to give you some ideas of numbers, this would be around 1100. Uh, this is an MPA for all these. MPA 1100, uh, 1170. F is 1760, and this is around negative 0.98 for 2024 aluminum. Uh, this is something more like 300. 475, 900, and zero, <coughs> negative 0 0.102. For TIE 64, TIE 6AL4V, uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of the most common titanium alloy. So 2024 aluminum is a copper aluminum alloy. Uh, 4340 is aircraft grade seal. Uh, titanium, very rarely do you actually see pure titanium. Almost all the time you'll see Ti-64. So titanium, 6 aluminum, 4 vanadium. Uh, this is kind of, the, kind of the most common titanium alloy because it is really strong and really nice. Um, 1185, 1230, 2030, and minus 0.104. So you'll notice all these scaling exponents are around minus 0 0.01. Um, and the reason the sigma f is so high, basically what we're plotting out here, um, is, let's say this is 10 to the 3, 10 to the 6, 5, 4, um, lower scaling, and then let's say a plateau after that. Um, yes, sorry. So basically, if this is our stress amplitude and this is our number of cycles to failure, um, this is my ultimate stress here. This is my sigma f prime um, because of this scaling Remember, there's a low cycle and a high cycle, uh, a low cycle and a high cycle fatigue. So if I just fit that low cycle fatigue, this would be uh, my one. Actually, not one. This would be zero. Um, here, uh, sigma f is equal to a divided by two to the b. So my a is slightly different. Um, so this is actually. Technically, if this is one cycle to failure, uh, then this would be my A, or sigma F prime over two to the B is equal to A. Um, but it's it's generally higher than my ultimate stress just because of the way this data gets fit. Um, because in this low cycle fatigue region, there's a different scaling than in my high cycle fatigue. Um, yeah. This would be on a log log plot, or yeah, I guess, yeah, it, it could go either way, but um, so this would be with, with this particular scaling relationship. So this would be on a log log plot. Mixing things up. Yes. Um, yes. And there's one, two, yep. Two B sigma F. There we go. Thanks.
Sorry about that. Okay. Cool. So, um, there's not enough time to get into too much more stuff. Let's define safety factors really quick. Um, so now, if I have these scaling relationships, I can define a safety factor, or factor of safety, uh, for a given stress. Safety factors, factors of safety uh, for my stress factor of safety. Um, factor of safety x s um, is equal to the a f over sigma a, where I'm going to use stress amplitude now. Uh, this is the stress amplitude to failure. Uh, this is for given n f. So sigma a f uh, is sigma uh, what do I want to do? a a and f uh, to the b, sorry, for given n, for given n, there we go. Um, for number of cycles, xn is my number of cycles to fail over the number of cycles that I'm applying. So, applied stress So if I know, here, let's roll back a sec, instead of just saying things really quickly. Um, if I know how many cycles my part is going to undergo, so if I, if I have a car axle and I know how many cycles it's going to undergo over time, uh, and I know how long I want it to last, say 10 years, I can say what my failure stress is, uh, and I can make sure my stress amplitude is below that. If I know uh, the max number of cycles to failure for a given working stress. So for like a like an aircraft fuselage, I know I'm going to be loading it to a certain pressure uh, to, to pressurize the cabin, uh, and then I know how many cycles I can cycle it to before it'll start to fail. So I know how many times I can take my airplane up and down before it'll start to something will start to go. Um, I can relate these two, but it's not as important. So tomorrow I'll talk about. What happens when you change the mean stress? What happens when you change the amplitude? Uh, and then what that means for the, the fracture or the internal flaws in the material.